Wonderful. All right. Well, let's uh, let's keep the pace going. It's like speed dating, like 25 minute sessions. We get some of the, the best content we have. And uh, this session here is part of our 360 degree view of cyber involves three incredible chief security officers. So thank you for joining me, the three of you. If you turn on your cameras, I think you're all on the cameras now. I can't quite see. I think so. But uh, I just want to welcome Brad Jones on here, Chief Security Officer of Snowflake. And looking forward to talking to you. Brad, I had to laugh when, when I looked at your bio. You only work for companies that start with the letter S. So yeah. I don't know what karma you've had with S, but it's been good karma. Welcome. Must be in my rider somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh because I told you this at the earlier part. My, my most successful companies all started with the letter F. FireEye and Four Scout and Forge Rock and Five Nine. I should have called my company Fire Dragon. So instead of Night Dragon. Also, for Vijaya Kaza, thank you for joining the head of engineering and trust and safety at Airbnb. Somebody I've known for a long time. Vijaya, thank you so much for joining. What an amazing career! Almost twenty years at Cisco, Lookout, FireEye, and now Airbnb. I know you're coming up on almost five years. Thank you for joining. Glad to be here, Dave. Yeah, great to have you. Appreciate you. And then also, last but not least, in the incredible Brian Sincera, the SVP and CISO, Head of Infrastructure Operations. I don't know how many words you can put on your card now, Brian, but I can't believe uh, what an incredible career you have from Pfizer. Things you've seen, we go way back as well. I know you've been at Pfizer quite a long time, but also you've chaired the H uh, ISAC as well, the health uh, healthcare ISAC for quite a few years and been a leader incredible leader in the world of cyber, especially in life sciences and healthcare, but all around the world. Brian, thank you for joining me as well. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. Yeah, great. I hope you're not in the snowstorm too, but I'm guessing you are. No, no I, I'm in Chicago, which is surprisingly uh, not snowy. It's like the only spot in the country there isn't snow, apparently. Yeah, and, and I, I think Brad and Vijay, you're on the West Coast, I'm assuming too, right? No snow, no snow in the Bay Area right now. No snow. Give it a, give it a minute. Uh, we'll, we'll get there for sure. Um, can the three of you maybe uh, talk about, Brad, you start for a second. Um, just talk a little bit about, if you can, you know, we we did some surveying ourselves on budgets and sort of year over year, 2023 to 2024. And I just have, I hate to say it, empathy, but I, I would just say um, uh, pride and and support for all of you. I think you have one of the hardest jobs there possibly is and have to deal with so many risks and so many issues. It's like being a hockey goalie. I always say you got got to stop pucks, you know, a hundred thousand times a day, and it's a really hard job to do. So we appreciate all of you. But talk a little bit about how you're seeing twenty three to twenty four, if you can, a little budget and environment, if you would, threat environment, risk environment, regulatory environment. How's it affecting you? Sure. Um, you know, I was thinking back on twenty twenty three, and just you know, we haven't fixed vulnerabilities. They keep coming out. We've had. You know, run C with container breakouts recently and glibc affecting potentially all versions of, of Linux. But um, if you look back at the big data breaches, what's still kind of surprising is, you know, we're getting hit by social engineering or people leaving the door open, right? So there's still an, a huge amount of effort that needs to go in and nailing the basics in the industry, right? In general, I would say. Um, you know, Rob brought up the casino breach, right? That came in through social engineering. So there, there needs to be a lot of effort put into effective controls, discipline, visibility. I, you know, often ask my team, like, tell us what we're not doing. You know, don't let's not highlight what we are doing. Let's understand where our gaps are. Um, and certainly, you know, with regulatory changes, the SEC, that's certainly putting a lot more focus at, really at every public company of, of making sure you have effective controls, risk management, and that really, you know, tracks down to budget. I was at a CISO dinner in the Bay Area last week around the table talking about budgets. I would say no one said their budget was decreasing um, next year. Now, you know, some of those companies, there's everyone from large corporations to startups, so very different situations, but at a minimum, they were flat to, to going up. Uh, you know, at Snowflake, we continue to invest in our, our security program. That is people, our processes, automation, and tools to continue to be effective in managing risk. But Jay, over to you. I know you've got a number of views on this and work with the community quite a bit. And this little thing called AI popped up in the last year, uh, which I know was a long time coming. But 
really affected things. And I know you're a bit of an expert in those areas. How have you seen 2023 going into 2024 and any budget comments that you could make overall? Yeah, Dave, uh, as you mentioned, you know, AI obviously has caught all of our imagination in 23. And um, the interesting thing is, even though we may not have seen major breaches around AI just yet, and to Brad's point, today's breaches are still uh, based on social engineering and other types of things. This is an area that that needs to be watched. And obviously, as you can tell from the entire cottage industry that's been now coming up to, to secure AI, that is that is definitely a trend going forward. Um, the other thing I would also say is um, the interesting thing that happened in 2023 is exploitation of vulnerabilities that exist in third-party tools that are kind of widely used across many companies, right? So that is an easy door in from, because once you find the right tool, lots of companies are using it and it's a, it's an easy uh, uh, way path in. So that's uh, those are the major you know uh, ways that I have noticed in 2023. And um, as far as budgets are concerned, I have to agree with, with Brad and also your previous panel. I think we have, uh, as an industry, uh, probably people have spent a lot of um, dollars in the last several years and, you know, starting 2022, 23, in, and uh, I, I expect this trend to continue in 24, which is, you know, looking at, in a more measured ways and being more disciplined around what have we invested in? Are we getting the most out of our existing tools? How do we really, um, you know, try to simplify, try to consolidate as much as possible. So I think that is inevitable. Um, I don't see budgets going down. I agree with that. But also don't think in general there will be huge spikes in budget either. So it, it'll be a measured, you know, based on actual need and maturity life cycle of a given company, I would think. Brian, over to you. I want to hear your perspective after uh, 20 years in the trenches plus in this world. So you know, give me your thoughts on 2023 and 2024, if you would. Yeah, I, I'd agree that there's, you know, there there's very few people that I know that are suggesting that there's budget declines. I, I think, you know, low to mid single digits seems to be pretty consistent in terms of increases. But I think the story that's underneath that is that many organizations, ours included, are being super aggressive on finding ways to automate to do takeouts of, of products that maybe aren't delivering quite the way they could or should. Labor, as you know, is incredibly tight in, in the cybersecurity space and labor is inflationary. Tech is actually deflationary. And so part of the approach that I've taken in a, you know, for those that have seen Pfizer stock recently, uh, you'll know it's been a pretty tough financial year uh, for the company you know, find a way to leverage what is a relatively nominal absolute budget increase with offsetting uh, spend reductions very aggressively in other areas, particularly around labor and automation, where I can then return those dollars into technologies that I think are are additive in terms of their effect. Yeah, Brian, pull on that for one more second, because one of the bigger themes you heard from the sell side analyst community as well was this best of breed, best of suite. And now the biggest of big, the Palos and the CrowdStrikes and the Zscalers of the world, kind of creating a best of breed in a best of suite, almost making it easier for you as CISOs to buy bigger and consolidate more. And I don't want to lead you on that, but how do you think about your kind of platforms of both best of breed to really get after a threat environment versus the best of suite? And how, do, how does that play in your decision? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, I, I have been incredibly frustrated by our industry, the technology in our industry delivering what I consider to be features as products for a long time. Uh, you know, for the first time in the, in the last few years, I'm really seeing companies like the ones that you have mentioned and a few others who are really bringing, form platform, bringing forward platform capabilities. And, and what I mean is great products in a suite, not just one product and a few clunkers wrapped around it, but a, a really a suite of products that that not only deliver well individually, but I think work incredibly well together. And there is a spot where I'm really seeing the labor arbitrage, you know, the, the, uh, the labor opportunities emerge when I don't have to have human glue piecing together products, building integrations, doing analytics, you know, collecting data, all the things that that are 
are complicated and, and sort of take a lot of, of humans to have to engineer and operate, that's money that I can return back into tech that I think is generating leverage. Yeah, interesting. But Jay, uh, maybe comment on that, but then also make a comment, if you would, about cyber in the boardroom. And for all of you, because you know, we did that study heard the other day, you know, very few CISOs on boards of big public companies. It's becoming a boardroom. We now have the SEC, you know, sort of requirements. This is potentially the start of many, many, you know, sort of elevations of cyber to the boardroom. I'd be curious how you think about a, your best of breed and best of sweep, but then how it then kind of how are you communicating to the board as well? And then I want to ask Brad that too. Yeah. So going back to best of breed and best of sweep, um, my personal opinion, Dave, is, you know, best tool for the best job. I don't think it gives anybody right away, but it, even if you're part of the best of suite, you know, uh, every solution, every tool has to win the POC and prove themselves out and whatever makes the best um performance in that is is what people should go with. Um, that's kind of my take on it. Uh, from there, going into uh, the second part of your question about boardrooms, you know, it is still shocking to your earlier point in the previous panel that there's so few cyber experts and technology experts in the boardrooms. Um, I understand the sentiment that not every new trend can be can turn into a board member necessarily that would be too much you know today it's cyber tomorrow you need an ai expert and day after tomorrow it's something else that is not scalable that said you know a broad based technology experts that that can cover multiple areas i think there is absolutely room for that um and uh, how we uh, communicate to the board also kind of depends on you know, what is the structure of the board and uh, what uh, what are they looking for, right? So from that perspective, having cyber experts and technology experts on the board uh, eventually makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I think um, I'm hopeful this trend will change in the next few years. Yeah, I agree. And by the way, you might have heard me say this. Not only was it only 1.4% had a cyber expert, and that was a pretty generous definition, even called 1.4%, but 54% of the S&P 500 didn't even have a tech expert. To your point of just a generalist to help right. them, so, you know, here's this board problem and this risk factor that's occurring that I find very interesting to watch that I think is going to change a lot. And the boards need people like yourselves because this risk is big. And of course, you can see that with some of the breaches and things. Brad, what's your thoughts on best of sweep, best of breed? I wanted to get your thought and then maybe any board comment. Sure. So, I mean, I think in the security industry, we've always had this kind of ebb and flow of bespoke products solving new problems and then kind of a consolidation. Um, I will say, I think there's been an acceleration of how quickly they come back into the, the best of suite. I think we have, you know, some of the large companies we've mentioned are doing a lot better job at quickly innovating, don't have the same sort of inertia in getting into these new markets. We certainly look at vendors. If we're bringing someone on, it's it's generally to consolidate to get you know. I want to bring one vendor on and get rid of two. Um, and you know, uh, as Brian said, we we focus a lot on our automation of making use of the tools that we have, the data from it. In my mind, you know, security is more and more a data game. So having all of those tools integrated in a data lake where we can do our analytics, we have a lot of work with our data science team that we partner with to get more and more value out of the tools that we have, the visibility that that creates. Um, as far as uh, the the cyber or tech uh, technology experience on the board, I've I've been lucky in my last two boards I've reported to that we have a strong uh, presence of that. Yes, you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm lucky in that that I'm not explaining the problem. I'm explaining what we're doing. Um, you know, that's a luxury that I've had that I haven't had to educate as much of what it is we're talking about of just how we're evaluating the risk and how we're addressing it. Uh, but certainly it's something that's important that every company should have to have that, especially with, you know, the new regulations coming in, they have to be able to interpret, are, you know, are the people in charge of this at the company addressing and managing risk appropriately? Let me make a let Brian comment on this too, because obviously Pfizer and the healthcare industry life sciences is a highly regulated uh, world as well. Um, how do you see the boardroom and you already commented a little best of sweet, best of breed there, just to, I think going forward, but how do you see that board interaction and how are you interacting with that board and you see that elevating yourself as you go forward? Yeah, I do have the advantage of board directors who are very scientifically oriented. 
So while I don't have a cyber expert per se, I will say that there are a couple of uh, board directors. Um, if you if you look at our lineup, that are tech CEOs and um, you know very very technically savvy, and therefore they come with an understanding of of uh, what we're up against that's been incredibly helpful. I honestly I don't know how any company. Um, cannot have technology expertise on the board. Cyber expertise, I think, can come along for the ride to a certain extent. I don't know that we need, you know, to Jay's point, we need to rotate that far. But lacking technology expertise feels like uh, an incredible miss on the part of uh, yeah. of any company's board. Brian, let me stay with you for a minute. I want to hear what keeps you up at night in in 2024 from a threat point of view. But you know, when I when I listen to this, you know, one stat that I keep throwing out, you know, when I was CEO of FireEye and Mandiant, we tracked about 800 threat groups, which at the time I was like, wow, there's 800 threat groups in the world, you know, 100 governments who have offensive cyber commands, criminal groups. And it seemed daunting back then. And this was seven years ago when I last ran that. Fast forward now, we have over 3,500 threat actors, like what we would really call you know, a unique threat actor with unique TDPs. I mean, 3,500. Last year alone, 953 net new actors showed up. Like that was more than I tracked for 15 years, happened in one year. And I'm curious when you look at the daunting challenge, we now have more bad actors out there in groups and we actually have cyber vendors. And so you're now looking at this incredible threat environment, in my opinion, that, you know, when you look at it from your point of view, but how do you see the threat environment and what one or two areas keep you up at night, Brian? Yeah, there are a couple of places that that have caught my attention most recently. Uh, generative AI as a mechanism for having incredibly convincing phishing. Um, all of the education that we've done, I think, has moved the needle a bit, but there's still a ton of gullible people out there. And and unfortunately, I think generative AI with fake, you know, deep fake voice and video is just going to get better at finding those who are vulnerable. Um, the other the other area is maybe more categorical, and that is speed. Um, you know, we keep talking about uh, you know nine on one or better response speed. You pick up the phone, you expect a police officer or fire department on the scene fighting the fire, you know, dealing with whatever the issue is in a matter of minutes, and our our capacity to be able to respond quickly, which backup means you've detected quickly, which backup means you've had telemetry, you've had analytics, you know, you back up that that story, but but that ultimately is the outcome is the place we need to be. And I, I think in the spirit of your you know, the way you framed the question, uh, that that's a, just a harder battle to fight every single day. Yeah. Generative AI meets spear phishing, meets identity, meets, you know, that's an interesting cross section. Uh, yeah. Maybe over to you, Vijay. What do you what's keeping you up at night? What kind of threat are you seeing that uh, we got to solve this year? I think, you know, I, I, I tend to look at more broadly uh, the industry level. Most CISOs probably have to deal with, um, I would say, three categories um, of issues. The first is related to data. You know, anything online, offline data, how do we secure it? How do we get better visibility into who are who is the, uh, who are we sharing the data with? Which third parties have access to our data and um, things of that nature? Mm -hmm. So um, that area is becoming very hot. Um, Dave, as you know, there's already been some m and and consolidation as well on the um, vendor side. So I think that will be, that will continue in 2024, I think. The second is related to applications. Anything related to vulnerabilities of um, application software, third party SaaS applications, you know, supply chain dependencies across, up and down the chain. So anything related to vulnerabilities in your software and applications, right? And the third, I would say, is related to humans. This is uh, this is again going back to the aspect of phishing and other things. We, we continue to see humans are uh, the weakest link in the chain. Typically, when we think of supply chain, we think about applications and tools. We don't think about humans in our supply chain and what they're being subject to. So I think it's one of those areas where it's continuous education, it's uh, secure coding practices, it's making everything easier for developers to consume and, and align and um, um, with security practices. So I think those are the three big areas, in my opinion. Yeah, good, good comments, Vijaya. Brad, over to you for a second. But you mentioned something that really struck me. If you look at the last couple of years, where were the biggest oh. attacks coming through? 
third party software, right? The supply chain, these attacks like Avante recently, any desk, but solar winds and all of these types of attacks, progress software, et cetera, and our inability to really secure that supply chain and all the secure by design that needs to happen in that area. How do you think about that problem, Brad? And you know, what what kind of threat keeps you up at night? Yeah, I mean, the software supply chain component is a, you know, everyone needs to be focused on that and understanding what controls they can put in place, what comfort level they the, the controls that those other companies have in place. You know, SolarWinds was certainly a, a wake up call for everyone of how broadly a uh, company can be compromised and how broadly that can get into various environments, you know, large corporations, our government, et cetera. Um, I would say kind of the human element is what keeps me up at night, Dave. You you mentioned the the sheer amount of groups out there you know, uh, looking to exploit anything that shows up. Um, we're not measured by all the successes. We're measured by the one failure that we have. Um, and the time to get something exploited that you leave open or that you don't patch is just shrinking day by day. There's so many people looking at it. So that people aspect of having the discipline, uh, visibility to make sure that you have comprehensive controls, that you're checking the locks on every door, not just the front door. Um, and then to, to kind of glom onto what Brian and Vijaya said about the social engineering, I think, you know, things like deep fakes, it's going to be more and more, we're going to see those coming in into like the help desk where you're using deep vo fake voices to emulate, you know, the panic executive saying, oh, I'm, I need to get into, you know, to my email right now. Um, that's going to be an avenue we're going to have to deal with. We're going to have to have a lot of rigor and discipline in our processes on validating identities, or you're going to be in the next casino in the news. Yep. Last question for you. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll I'll start over here with Brian. How are you dealing with AI security? Like I, you mentioned generative AI for a minute, and you know we we just watched over fifty billion go in investments into AI, building applications, building platforms, but only about two hundred million going into security of AI. So whenever I see like that kind of problem of dislocation, you're like, uh oh, this problem's coming. Are you testing new AI security products? Are you waiting for the bigger vendors to help you? How have you approached AI security, uh, if a quick answer could be done? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're active, very active in this marketplace. I say the only thing newer than generative AI is the technology to secure it. Um, and I will say we're taking the approach of try a little bit of everything. I think that gap has got to close, and it's got to close fast. Yeah, good answer. Vijay, over to you. I can answer specifically um, about what we're doing, but in general, I think it's a multi-layer problem, right? So it's not just about the models and securing the models. I think people and organizations have to start with data, with infrastructure, every layer of what's what goes into creating great AI in general and, and securing every aspect of it. Yeah, I wanted to ask this question last because we have our AI panel next. So uh, Brad, last word for us on this panel. Um, I, I think with AI, I think, you know, the biggest thing you can do as a company is provide a playground for your employees to use it in a safe manner rather than them going out and exposing your data and services elsewhere. So, you know, embrace it. Don't uh, stop it. Yeah, beautiful. Listen, Brian, really appreciate good seeing you, my friend. And uh, thank you for nice. all years of service. Vijaya, uh, great to see you as well. Thank you and congrats on your whole career, all of you and Brad. I'll look for your next S company, but stay at Snowflake for a long time. Stay here for a while. And, uh, thank you, all three of you, for joining. You. Really appreciate you, and good luck in 2024. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Dave. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.